So I think most of us know what it means to say that something is counterintuitive. It's something that's true, something that is a fact, but that doesn't make immediate sense to us. Your common sense, your gut, tells you that it just can't be true. It goes against your intuition. For example, for centuries, people believed that the earth was flat. When they wrote about the earth, when they described the earth, when they painted it, it was always in terms of it being flat. Why did they think that? Well, the reason is simple. Look out your window, because that's what it looked like. Quite frankly, it still does. To have said that the earth was round would have been counterintuitive. Which is why, even when the evidence began to come out, people thought that it was crazy to say that the earth was round. The same thing with the movement of the earth in relation to the sun. For centuries, people believed that the sun was what actually moved around the earth. Because that's the way it looked. It wasn't until Copernicus and the revolution that he set in motion that we found out that in truth it's the earth that revolves around the sun. But that's not the way it looked. It was counterintuitive. You look outside and it looks like the sun is moving across the sky. Which is why even to this day we talk about sunrise, sunset. Even though the sun doesn't do either of those. Another example, you're in your car, you're out in slick road condition, you go a little bit too fast around the curve and the, and the back end starts to skid a little bit. Your intuitive reaction to the driver is to do what? Steer the opposite direction. That's what most people would do. But that is the one thing you shouldn't do, is steer in the opposite direction. You should actually steer, steer into the skid. So if your rear end is going to the right, you should steer to the right. It's counterintuitive, but that's exactly what you should do. The best way to stop your car from skidding. One more example. In World War II, a statistician by the name of Abraham Wall was asked by the British to help them figure out the best way to add armor to their bombs. He studied the airplanes that had returned from battle, and he concluded that they should add armor where the planes had not been hit by any bullets. <coughs> they looked at him and said, that doesn't make any sense. Why would we add it to where there weren't any bullets hit? And he said, go look at the planes. You see all the bullet holes all over the planes from those that returned safely from battle. Don't put any armor where they already were hit. Only put armor where there are no bullet holes. And they again said, you're going to have to explain this to us. And he said, the planes that we have to, stu have to study are the ones that made it back to base safely. If they returned safely, that means they survived the attack. If you look where those planes had been shot, we can assume that there is a sufficient amount of protection where they were shot because they made it back safely. Which means we can assume the ones that did make it back safely were shot somewhere else. So we should study all those planes that returned and put additional armor where they were not shot. They did. It worked. Casualties went down, but it was completely counterintuitive. There are a lot of things in this life that are true, but you just feel like they shouldn't be true. Principles that work, that we don't think should work. And we're going to talk about one of those today. We've been in this series called Money for Life, and the idea behind it it's simple. We need money. Money for food and clothing, housing, education, you name it. We need money for all these things. 
And the Bible has a lot to offer us, a lot to say about this time. But what it says is not about a life for money, a life that revolves around money, that makes it the focus of everything that we do. So not a life for money, but money for life. And we talk about how the Bible has four big principles that we've been going through about how to get this money that we need for our lives. And if we invest in these four big principles, God tells us that he is going to show up for us. And he's going to honor us for following his wisdom. So we've been walking through these one each week. To that, and these principles will help to ensure that we have about as a constant flow of money that we can hope for. The first principle that we looked at was that if you want money for life, you have to earn it. You have to get out there and work. You have to do everything you can to make money. And we talked about the two ends of the extremes. On the one end, you have these pillow perversion. Those that are looking for get-rich-quick schemes, the easiest way to get money is the minimal amount of work trying to find that we have a sense of entitlement, doing all these things to short-circuit having to work. But on the other end, we saw those who develop an addiction to earn it. And everything is about making that money. Then last week, we looked at the second principle. That if you want money for life, you have to save it. We saw how we often say that we don't have any money to save. But the truth is we lack the desire to save. You see, compared to most of the world, we are already rich. We whine about our first world problems. With every paycheck, the real challenge for us is whether we are going to pay ourselves or treat ourselves. When we looked at the dark side of this, the opposite extreme, where you get into greed and hoarding. Today we come to that third big principle. And it's going to be one of the most counterintuitive principles you're going to hear. When you hear it, you might think to yourself, that's crazy, it can't be true, that's not the way it really works. It's not how any of this stuff works. It's so commercial. But the Bible would say it is true. It might be counterintuitive, but it's true. So the Bible tells us that if you want money for life, you not only have to earn it, you not only have to save it, you also have to give it. Let's look at what the Bible has to say about this. And then let's see if maybe, just maybe, this falls into the earth is round, the sun doesn't move, turn into the skid, put armor where you haven't been shot. Type of category. The classic text when it comes to this topic is in the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi is an interesting book. The last book of the Old Testament, after which comes 400 years of silence, which is then followed by the coming of Jesus. So Malachi is interesting because it's the book that God inspired to end the Old Testament era and to be ringing in the ears of everyone before Jesus came. So what does Malachi say about this? You have a long history of ignoring my commands. You haven't done a thing I told you. Return to me so I can return to you, says God. You ask. But how do we return? Begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? But you rob me day after day. You ask, how have we robbed you? The tithe and the offering, that tithe. And now you're under a curse, a whole lot of you, because you're robbing me. Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury, so there will be ample provisions in my temple. Test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you, and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. For my part, I will defend you against marauders, protect your wheat fields and vegetable gardens against plunderers. 
God is not after something from you. He wants something for you. If you'll hear him out and really think about it, the power of his will will be amazing. Because this is all about how to live to receive what God wants to give you. Now I know some of that language from that verse may get lost. It's not language sometimes we use all that often. So I want to give you a quick five word dictionary. And I think that it will open up the Bible, this passage, in ways that it needs to be opened up. So those five words are tithe, offering, temple, curse, and blessing. The first word tithe literally means 10%. And it was used for the practice of taking 10% of everything you earn, whether through labor, inheritance, windfall, or sale, and giving it to God. It's based on all of your income, meaning the gross income, not the net income. That's where you get this idea of bringing your full tithe. You see, some people, when they think about the tithe, they try and figure out a way to get around it, how to shortchange it. They say, okay, what does 10% really mean? Does it include stocks or just my payroll? When I sell the stock, is it on the initial value of the stock or on how it has appreciated? Is it just on my salary? Is it on my bonus too? Since I have to live, could not just be 10% after what I have after I've paid all my bills and my living expenses? And speaking of living expenses, aren't my children considered a ministry? So the money I spend on the ministry of my children we should count that too, right? And by the way, I have the gift of hospitality. So I open up my house to people and I have, even have a small group in my house. So my mortgage counts too, right? In fact, when I add all this up, I think God owes me a refund. It's easy to do that. It's, it gets a little bit outlandish there, but it's easy to figure out ways to avoid paying that time. God realized that, and, and he, this is what he would tell us. Everything you have, I gave you. Your very next breath is my gift to you. Let's not screw around. I'm asking you to honor me as the one who has given you everything. To be generous as I have been generous to you. To bring the whole time on everything you've been given and all that you have received, that should be your fault. Unfortunately, it's often not better. So, when you pull out an envelope in this church, or if you pay online, when you go online, when you give money and you designate that money as time, what does that money do? And I asked the conference for this next slide so that I can tell you exactly where that money goes. In the Carolina Conference, this is what your tithe dollars do. That biggest percentage right there, 37% of your tithe dollars goes to pay for pastors in churches that have pastors. The next percentage that I want to look at is up here where it says World GC and Union. That percentage doesn't stay here. That goes to help other world divisions. You see, it's our privilege in the North American Division to help fund the work of the other 12 world divisions where there are financial challenges. So that amount sent goes out to the rest of the world and helps to fund nearly 1,000 missionaries worldwide. In addition, these funds support other aspects of the world church, such as publishing houses, universities, um, administrative costs, and stuff of that nature. Another category is education. 
That is money that when you give tithe, that goes to help pay for things such as Tri-City Christian Academy, Mount Pisgah Academy, things of that nature. That money will go to pay, help pay for education. The next one is up here, the CMNPR, that's not National Public Radio. CM stands for Camp Meeting, NPR stands for Ahsoka Pines Ranch. A portion of that tithe dollars goes to pay for Camp Meeting each year, which actually starts tomorrow, um, and to help run the summer camp that we have down in Ahsoka Pines. Then we have 6% to go to departments. Departments represent the amount of money used to fund our ministry departments here in the conference, such as the Sabbath School Department, Youth Department, Children's Ministries, Men's and Women's Ministries, so on and so forth. There's a lot of ministries that that money pays for. You then have the retirement portion. And that again goes to help pay for the retirement of conference employees. Then the last one is the administrative cost. That portion pays the administrative expenses of the Carolina Conference. The salaries of the president, benefits to the president, the two vice presidents, the support staff, which includes treasury and human resources. Also includes the cost for insurance, utilities, office supplies, stuff of that nature. So when you give money, either again here locally or online, and you designate that money for tithe, that is what it pays for here in the Carolina Conference. The next word that we're going to define is offering. Now, a lot of people think that that's the exact same meaning as time, but it's not. They're completely different words, completely different uses. An offering was anything that you gave above and beyond your time, because 10% was considered to be the bare minimum. It was meant to be the floor, but never the ceiling. So out of gratitude and commitment to God, people would give an offering above and beyond their time. The offering that you give, again, here locally, sitting here or online, that money stays local here in the church. It's what pays for everything that we do here at Pat. Quite frankly, if all, every, everyone sitting here, if all they ever did was pay tithes and never paid an offering, this church would shut down. Because the tithe doesn't pay our rent, the tithe doesn't pay for our community service, the offering pays for that. So that's why it's important to give an offering, to not just give a tithe. The third word that we're going to look at is temple. That's the designated place of people to worship. The center of a person's community of faith. The central place of ministry for the people of God. In the New Testament, the temple became the local church. Which is why throughout the New Testament, the tithes and offerings of God's people were to go to the church of which they were a part. Nowhere else. The tithe isn't about giving to the United Way, disaster relief, but to your church. So those other entities may be very well good entities, and you can certainly support them, but that is not what your tithe is for. Did Jesus back this up? Did he affirm this? Absolutely. You see, even in his day, there was a give and take, a back and forth about tithing. People were trying to figure out whether to tithe or not to tithe, how to get out of tithing, good tithing, bad tithing. Some pushed it aside and played fast and loose with the idea, while others were incredibly careful about it, almost to a legalistic fashion. They didn't match their tithing with a heart of mercy and compassion and generosity. They followed the letter of the law, but not the spirit. So either people tithe but had cold hearts, prided themselves on their spirituality but didn't tithe. So Jesus stepped in. I like to think of him slapping both of them upside the head. Probably do that thing. 
to the ones who tithe without heart. He said this in Matthew. You are careful to tithe, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. And that's how you can screw up giving. Yeah. By making it something legalistic. You can give in order to get a pat on the back, a name on the wall, a sense of superiority. But have a heart that's shriveled and cold, small and unfeeling. Caring about nothing that God meant that offering to serve. But to those who prided themselves on heart and compassion, but didn't tithe, he quickly added this. But you should tithe, yes. So while you can screw up giving with a legalistic part, giving itself is not screwed up. We are marked by giving. And when people don't, when people keep everything that God gives them, or don't allocate it in the way that God asks, it's serious. God calls it robbery. Because the money's not yours and it's not mine. I'm asking for a portion of it back. If you keep it, you're stealing from me. And let me tell you what happens when you steal from God. And that brings us to the next term. Curse. Let me read again what Malachi says here. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob him. But you ask, how do we rob you? In times and offerings, you're under a curse. The whole nation of you. Because you are robbing them. To be under a curse wasn't like some enchantment or spell on Harry Potter. In the Bible, to be under a curse meant that, that you were outside of God's blessing. Outside of his umbrella of protection and provision. It meant that you were operating independent of his supernatural oversight and intervention. Certainly not where you want to be. Which brings us to the fifth and final word to define. Blessing. God follows up the word curse by saying, but if you'll do this the way that I'm prescribing, you don't need to have any concern about this. The idea is that if we give, we will receive. So what kind of blessing can we expect? You see, there, are, there were two extremes that people can take on what the Bible means by this blessing. The first extreme falls into the name it, claim it, health and wealth approach that says, tithe, and you too could supernaturally have a BMW in your driveway tomorrow. Because God will give it to you. That's not only crazy. It's false teaching. You hear it on the TV by some of those TV evangelists, but it's a lie. That is not biblical. But the other extreme is just as off base. The side that says, God doesn't bless it all financially. That there is no relationship between what you do financially and what God does in your life. That's not true either. The Bible teaches without qualification that if you follow God into this aspect of financial management, He will bless your life. So what kind of blessing? It's up to God. It could be direct, directly financial in terms of an increase or windfall. It could be in a favor shown on an enterprise or an expansion, a breakthrough, or the attempt of a discovery of some sort. His blessing can rain down on us in any and every way imaginable. 
It's up to him. But there's one thing that we can say for sure. Because God's very specific about one dimension of how he will bless us. There's one thing he says that we can be absolutely confident of coming our way. In the passage we just read, where it made reference to protection from marauders and plunderers, people and things that would take away the money from you. The kinds of things you might naturally worry about if you began to give your money away. Money that might be your margin, your safety net, your security. God is making it clear that those who follow him in this area will never have to worry about their giving, taking away from their supplies. They can rest assured that they wouldn't lose ground because of their generosity. He would supernaturally care for their needs. And we see this in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, it says this. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all of your income. And he will fill your barns and wheat with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. And then Jesus himself in Matthew says this. So don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well that you need them. And he will give them to you if you give him first place in your life. And live as he wants you to live. It's as if God is saying, trust me enough, care about me enough, and honor me enough to do what I say in this area of money management. And in return, I will become supernaturally involved in your life in a unique way, bringing incredible levels of blessing including a specific blessing that you will never have to worry that your giving will leave you without enough for your own needs. Take care of your money in the normal ways. Don't binge. Don't go crazy with debt. Do your part. And I'll do my part. Now how do we do this? I'm going to suggest that it takes three steps. They all start with P, so let's say three P's. The first P stands for priority. Prioritize your giving. Make the first check you write when you get paid your tithe and offering. Before the mortgage, before groceries, before clothes, before savings, before those tech toys that you love so much. Honor Him with it. Prioritize your giving. The second P stands for percentage. You see, it's not about the amount you give. And we see this in the book of Matthew where Jesus tells us a story, and it's a very interesting story. He tells us, it's like a man going off on an extended trip. He called his servants together and delegated the responsibilities. To one he gave $5,000. To another, $2,000. To a third one, $1,000. Then he left. Right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. The second did the same. But the man with the single thousand dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money. After a long absence, the master of those three servants came back and settled up with them. The one given $5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment. His master commended him. Good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. The servant with the 2000 showed him how he had doubled his master's investment. His master commended him, good work, you did your job well, from now on, be my partner. The servant given 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards 
and hate careless ways, that you demand the best and make no allowances for care. I was afraid I might disappoint you. And so I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last step. The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little interest. Jesus wants to make something clear in that story. The amount of money you have to work with doesn't matter. What, is, what does matter is how you manage that amount. God's not concerned about how much, but how you manage it. The same affirmation, the same positive word was said to the person who turned 5,000 into 10,000 as the one who turned 2 into 4. And it would have been that way if the guy with 1,000 turned it into 2. The question wasn't the amount. The question was using it as much as possible in a God-honoring way. The only person found to be lacking in the story was the one who knew what he should have done, but didn't do. Everything you have been given has been given to you as part of a life test. And God is sitting back, waiting to see how you're going to manage it. What are you going to do with that test? Whether you're going to use it in a way that honors him, and follows his principles. That's why it's so important for you to manage what you've been given. And why percentages are what it's all about. You see, if Warren Buffett gave a thousand dollars a year, would that be God honoring? No. It's a terrible percentage. Jesus made it clear what he was looking at. In another story from the book of Mark. Sitting across from the offering box, he was observing how the crowd tossed money into the collection. Many of the rich were making large contributions. One poor widow came up and put in two small coins, a measly two cents. Jesus called his disciples over and said, The truth is that this poor widow gave more to the collection than all the others put together. All the others gave what they'll never miss. She gave extravagantly what she couldn't afford. She gave for all. So what percentage should you give? Well, I'll start with a tie. 10% should be your goal. And I understand if you're not getting anything right now, it might take you a while to get there. And I understand that. If you haven't managed your life in a certain way, maybe you're not familiar with these biblical principles on money management. Maybe you were raised in a home that was fiscally irresponsible. And you didn't grow up with the kind of teaching and mentoring in your life. It was really easy to get into some deep weeds even by the time you're 20. You may have no clue how to see the light through those weeds. And a 10% tie for you if you're in that situation. Quite frankly, isn't even an option. So make that your goal. But the most important thing is to start somewhere. Even if you have to start with just 1%, start. You may say, well, 1%, does that even count? Better than zero. God cares about your heart. So don't make this a do or don't, legalistic kind of way of thinking. It's about your heart and your relationship with Jesus Christ. And those who 
don't get anything, the zeros. Then say I don't, I don't get it, I don't understand. See, I don't want anything from you. I want something for you. If there is any aspect of my heart that beats for the people sitting in this church, if I have any kind of compassion or love for you guys, then I'm going to do everything under my power to get you under a blessing and away from a curse. And that's what Malachi said, does it not? God cares about your heart. So start somewhere. That brings us to the third P, which stands for progressive. To be progressive in your giving simply means that over time, you raise the percentage. If you make $30,000 a year and you get 10% of that salary, that's a lot of money for you. That's sacrificial. A huge impact on your heart, your faith, and your trust. And you have no idea how God smiles on that management. And it makes a huge difference in people's lives. 10% of 30000 would be $3,000 a year. That would greatly affect community service projects that we do here at PAC. It would be strategic to the mission of the church in reaching out to those who are far from God, but that have a God-shaped hole in their life that desperately needs to. It matters. But fast forward several years or decades, you're now making $200,000. The kids are grown, the house is paid off, you're still giving 10%. Just twenty thousand dollars. That's a lot of money as well. But sacrificially, is it as much of a sacrifice as that ten thousand, as the ten percent of thirty thousand? Should it be a little more progressive than that? As you're blessed, that you get more. But what it means is that you gotten that much richer and have that much more that God has trusted you to manage. It is still a life test. So giving should be a priority, a percentage, and progressive. Let's go back to where we started. That one of the biggest principles of giving money for life is giving it away. That counterintuitive idea that when you give, you actually receive. And there's a reason why that's true. And that reason is God's heart. God's love for you. Because no matter how much you give, no matter how much it stretches your faith, no matter how much it puts your trust in the crucible, you will never, you will never outgive God. And here's a great summary of this from the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul tells us this. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. I thought about that passage. Imagine how it must affect the heart of a generous God. When he sees one of his children being generous, reflecting his heart to the world and his values and his character, imagine how it must thrill God 
to give to that person. Knowing that they will be a conduit of his love and mercy and power and strength, compassion and concern to a lost and hurting world. When a generous God, with a heart for all of his creation, knows that when he flows resources to that person, they won't just use it for themselves. They won't just get bigger and bigger houses, more and more toys, live an ever increasingly lavish lifestyle. They won't simply trade in the Buick for a Benz, maybe give to the church a tip every now and then, and pat themselves on the back. When a generous God, with a heart for his creation, knows that what he gives will be met with generosity, and used to fuel his church for optimal mission, helping the church to feed the hungry, helping the church to help the working poor break out of a cycle of poverty, to provide medical care for the sick, to rescue sex trafficked adolescent girls from a brothel. Come. Would God ever want the supply for that person? To end. Certainly not. How do you think a God with a heart of a father toward his creation? A generous God who, as the scripture says, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. How do you think a generous God feels and acts to those who are generous themselves? He will never want to stop flooding your life with resources. He will delight in flowing them to you. Because he has found you trustworthy. And you are passing that light. You won't ever be able to outgive him. So as counterintuitive as it may sound, I'll say it again. If you want money for life, you are going to want to give. Now, it's going to test your faith like nothing else. Is it going to be an adventure of faith and trust? Yes. If you're up for that adventure, you're not going to want to miss out on this biblical principle. In fact, you can't afford to miss out. That's right. That's right. Lord, thank you for the fact that we can never outgive you. That you are more generous than we could ever even think of. Help us to live this principle. Help us to realize that when we give to you, we give to you to help others. To reach those that have that God-sized hole in their life. Help us to be the witness that this community needs. And help us to, to give to you express them so that we can reach those who need to know you. Guide us and direct us in your son's name.